Hello Tubes. Time and time again when I reflect on the philosophical divergence between myself and uh, most progressives, I'm led to the end of the 18th century and the way that Kant dealt with Hume and that the way that the German idealists like Fichte, Schelling and Hegel took up and ran with Kant's transcendental idealism. Firstly, I tend to view Hume as something of a frustrated naturalist, somebody who wanted to understand morality in terms of the human passions and the passions in, as they exist in a natural order, but was somewhat frustrated by uh, the tools he had available at, uh, to him at the time to do so, which were rather limited. So I'd agree that Kant is something of an upgrade. His category is offering um, an important idea of the synthetic a priori concepts that are necessary for us to make sense of our senses, even though they're not directly sensible. But of course, in order to make that work, Kant had to construct a rather odd transcendental idealism, where in the way things really are must correspond somehow ultimately to the way our mind shapes them. But uh, the important point here is this is where the German idealists come in. Because this loose end in Kant was this idea that the operation of the mind is somehow formative of, of, the, of, the, of the reality. And the operation of mind that the idealists had was absolutist. There was an absolute um, ultimate mental pattern to the way our understanding and explanation of things worked. Now of course other things have happened in the meantime. Marx famously materialised the dialectic structure or progress of history and there were strands of existential thought and phenomenology that have also contributed to modern progressive thought. But the root of contemporary political progressive theory does seem to be when the German idealists pick up and run with Kant's constructive transcendental idealism. At the time that Hegel wrote the Phenomenology of the Spirit, sort of besieged by Napoleon, um, yep, Europe was aflame. The, 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 the sweeping dialectics of history were washing over Europe rather dramatically, whereas science, well, Dalton had barely published his um, theory of atomic weight, and people were still coming to terms with the non-existence of phlogiston gas. So Hume as an empiricist and a naturalist might have been, you know, frankly, unable to respond to Kant's criticisms or to account for the things that Kant had reasonably brought forward as being necessary for understanding but lacking in Hume's rather crude empiricist 18th century account of um, human perceptions or indeed human passions. So the continental idealist tradition got to, well, seize the means of production when it comes to socio-political explanation and to some extent when it comes to a kind of progressive political morality as well. But that's not to say that we can't perhaps wrestle it back, especially when we consider what the relationship was between what Hume and Kant said uh, in light of our contemporary early 21st century understanding of the natural world and in light of the methodologies and, me and approaches that we have at hand now, a project that I like to call the empirical left which is, in a way, a bit like uh, time travelling back to the end of the 18th century and forging an alternative timeline or alternative history in which Hume was able to give Kant what he wanted um, to account for the criteria that Kant had laid down uh, as, to, as to what we need in order to make sense of our senses. And also to be able to make more of a response with regards to how our passions, our natural passions, can account for the conventions of virtue. Things like that. Things that might have opened up an alternative explanatory and evaluative framework for a progressive ideology. Because I think the one that we've got now, as progressives, it's not that good. We need something better. 
So thank you for listening. <laughs>